Welcome back to another Nerd Social, and we're here, here again at Seven Deadly Fairies. Uh, this time we are talking about how to make a board game. So if you were thinking about making a board game or wanted to buy a board game, this will give you a lot of information leading up to that effect. Uh, today we are again uh, guested with... Hi, I'm Zach Arbor. I play, host, and teach board games. We have Lindsay. I'm Lindsay, as Eric said, and I'm a graphic designer, so I'll be talking about art and making things print-ready. Uh, I'm Clyden Karami, I'm a pop culture expert, and I'm also a storyteller. Brian Hank, uh, I design games, publish games, and run a bunch of Kickstarter campaigns. Not to mention that, you also have a pretty awesome uh, podcast. Ah, thank you. Yes, Board Game Business Podcast. We just talk about the, the business side, kind of boring stuff about like actually behind-the-scenes making games. And that's definitely something I want to point out. So if you don't get what you want from here or you want more, uh, I will put a link below for his podcast because there's a lot of information you can get from that as well. And then I, of course, am Eric Suth. I am your host, unfortunately for you, fortunately for me. Uh, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about board games. The first thing I want to kind of talk about is about the cost for board games. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, a very simple, like, small print of, like, like a card game, just a card game, no board uh, you're looking at about, for like a one-off, about $15 from a lot of companies. If you wanted to do a, a bigger print run, you can get that for like 1000 for about $8. This is, again, estimates, not exact. And then if you go all the way to 10,000 copies, you can get it down to usually about $3. Again, depending on what you put inside the box, and depending on what quality you're going for. Um, that being said, let's go directly into the idea of making games. Um, so, first thing I would say is, like, how do you find a unique concept, right? Because that's the thing that everyone goes to. Like, when it comes to a game, the thing that initially grabs people is the concept. Um, whether it's a strategy game that's about, like, Greece, or an agricultural game. Like, these things are things that grab people. So, how do you find that? Now, being the people that have made the most here, I'm going to go with Brian first. Brian, sure. you've come up with some pretty awesome and interesting concepts for games before. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I would say the play, just playing more games and just seeing what else is out there. Uh, it, that's where you want to start, you know. And and you can take something that already exists. You know, the most common ones are like Monopoly or Cards Against Humanity, and then you can make a game that's very similar to that, and as just kind of a starter, you know, and just uh, just to start making games, you know, and just trying it out. So. Just take, take games that you like uh, and you know other people like, and then that's that's kind of a good starting point. Um, but then I think it's more about the experience, and it's not about the mechanics that you that that you want to use um, or even the theme. But it's about you know how does that game make you feel, and what's fun about that game? These games that you like, um, and then building off of that. So if you've played uh, Pandemic, is a, is a popular one. When you're when you're drawing a card from that, and you you don't know if it's an if if it's an epidemic card or if it's gonna add cubes to a city that's about to uh, about to um, outbreak. Outbreak. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, is that you? There's like a really intense feeling when you do that, um, and and it's fun. And so if you can make that in your game, if you like that experience, make something similar. Come up with a new theme or or try to replicate that, but but do it in a different way. If you you know to be unique and stand out. So there's actually a really interesting, you brought up Cards Against Humanity. So uh, there is a thing in the industry that, I don't know if you know about this, but, uh, so Guillotine. You know Guillotine, the game Guillotine? Guillotine's an amazing game. It's a line-based game where you basically have things in a row, and you're trying to game those things. People have to take their turns around the table. Um, that is a game that's existed for a while, similar to Apples for Apples. Cards Against Humanity came out in the marketplace and made a game that was a like a reskin almost of Apples to Apples. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the first for sure. And it's definitely not the last. To the point where people are now saying they're skinning Cards Against Humanity. But no, it's a skin of apples to apples. Mm. But uh, there's a great game that came out. I'm a huge fan of it. I backed it actually on Kickstarter called You Are the Maniac. And you Are the Maniac kind of took that mechanic. They made some unique changes to it. But they got horrendously trashed. Hmm. Because people were like, this is just a stolen from guillotine. So there is in the industry kind of like a, like a thin line. Like where some, like you can't be the first person take a mechanic but you can definitely be the fifth yeah <laughs> <laughs> if if you're the tenth it really starts to like it gets like oh it's it's played out but like yeah. there is like varying levels in which you can kind of take mechanics 
But as long, in my opinion, as long as it's unique enough to kind of create a new kind of game, I think that kind of hits it. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? I definitely think there's a timing aspect. Um, you, you kind of do have to either get lucky or follow the trends. But I, I, I can see two identical games succeeding or failing just dependent on how the market is at the given time that they release. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think in today's world there's there's so many people and so so much creativity that you never like while you're working on something you never know if someone's working on something very similar. Mm-hmm. So so I agree. You know, it's really about right place, right time, and and uh, yeah, being unique enough to where it's like okay, this is this is the same exact thing, or okay, this is similar, but like it's it's different. Like Cards Against Humanity, I always like when someone doesn't know that game yet, but they know Apple Staples. I always say like. It's a rated R version of Apple Snapple, yeah. uh, kind of thing. So, it gets it in the door. Yeah, so. And that brings the next question. So when you're making a board game, it's not just a matter to have a good idea or to basically find a way to market it and get it out to the public. There's also making sure it works. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of that. I mean, you guys have played games that they haven't actually fully play tested before, and it's easy to oh, tell. Oh, yeah. But play testing is important. So, I mean, what would you suggest, Brian? Why don't you give us a little? Like, what would you suggest sure. that would solve that issue for a lot of game designers? Well, it's it's actually really easy to make a game that works, where you have rules, you go through, start to finish. There's a winner at the end. Uh, that's actually pretty easy, and you can take a game that already exists and kind of just change it a little bit, and you have a game, and you you created it, and it's influenced by other games, but uh, it's it, it works. Um, but is that game fun? That's what that's what's tough. Uh, to actually make it make it fun that people want to play again when they're done. So um, in order to do that, it's really you really just have to make a lot of games. Yeah. Um, the first game you make probably won't be that much fun. So you got to find people. Um, if you play with your friends and family, they're going to tell you, it's, "Oh, that's a great game. You know, <laughs> good job." You know. Um, but uh, if you can play play with as many people that that know nothing about you, don't know you, and aren't afraid to tell you what they really don't like about it. Or what really isn't fun, uh, and and so uh, Meetup.com is a great place to do that. I did that. Yeah. They, yeah. they also have a official playtesting group in Pasadena. If you're in Los Angeles area, um, Strategicon. I don't know if you go to Strategicon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Strategicon is a great place. They give you time to basically play. You can actually put your name on the list and make yourself in the book that people will find you. And that's a great way to get people to try out your game. Um, and you can even open it up to the public appeal. You could put a like bare bones copy of your game online. And put it on my people to try out. They can I, give their feedback. I love print and play copies of games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great way to get it out there, though. I mean, like, and the people can tell you, like, I love this game or I don't like this game. Mm-hmm. It's the easiest way to do it. And then you don't even bouldering the cost on that. Um, next is going to be creating art. Now, that's always a difficult area because how do you know like what to give people? Like, like, oh, like I'm not the best artist. I can I can cobble together like a stick figure, <laughs> but I'm not the best. Now, uh, Lindsay, you're an artist. Oh, thank you, you. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> I love what you do. Um, would you agree? Because I'm going to give you a number here and tell me if this sounds right. Um, per artbusiness.com, they specifically say that you should you know, factor in your cost uh, for your materials. They say, like, for instance, like it's $50 materials. Uh, factor in uh, $20 hour, dollars an hour, which seems fair for mm-hmm. an artist, if not low. This is starting artist, by the I'll way. I'll let you finish, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> this is starting independent artist. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then you basically take your, your time spent, Times the your what you value your time is worth mm-hmm. plus materials and you get your amount. So for instance, if you were to spend a certain amount of time, you might be looking at four fifty for a piece of art. Mm-hmm. I mean that's like starting stuff. Do you think that's accurate? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean there are good things, and I know I you know I sort of hate doing this saying, but um, if you are uh, if you're able to like say this was created by Lindsay Garber at lindsaygarber.com on the bottom of each card or something like that, I might be able to do a lower price because whoever gets those cards or plays those cards, they see that I made the art. But there is certain variants of levels of art and art style. So mm-hmm. such as Cards Against Humanity, which rarely has art, only with their special packs, which they even put out a graphic design pack, uh, which was really cool, with some famous designers who got together mm-hmm. and created some really hilarious cards. And then there's things like uh, Joking Hazard, which is just stick figures. So <laughs> I guess there's a different level to what the consumer or the um, person hiring you is expecting for the type of game that they have. Uh, versus what you know you're able to put out, so in the amount of time. So I guess it very much varies, 
but um, uh, Cards Against Humanity and Joking Hazard are extremely successful, and I bet you those cards took seconds to make. Yeah, true. What do you think? Do you think it's about playing an artist? You, you've probably paid artists for the game oh, for yeah. Time, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's the most when, expensive part of the game, right? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's expensive. Um, and uh, it, when you're first starting out, like your first game, you can, you know, find... Do it yourself um, to start um, to start with like play testing and getting the game design. Once you're ready to you know actually have people want to buy it and give you know for them to give you money for it, uh, you want a professional to do it, of course. But um, what I, I guess what I do now, and I've made a lot of games, um, I'll I'll find artists that I like, um, and then I'll give them a budget and say uh, I have an eight thousand dollar budget, um, and these are the number of cards I have. You know, you know you know, 50 cards that will need to be done, and these are the dimensions, and um, and give them all the components, uh, what I would expect for them to do. And then usually, if they're, if they're experienced, they can they can find an art style that they have done before that would fit that budget. So they can do something simple, um, if that's on the lower end of what they would, you know, they think they can do for that amount of money, uh, or they can do something really good, really detailed, spend a lot of time on it, um, if it's a, an 18 card game, you know, or a, a simple one. Uh, so that, that's usually how we approach it, and you know we find we, you know, we we I have a huge list of uh, of illustrators and graphic designers that I go to when we have a new game, and uh, it, we it's incredibly important to find the right artist for mm -hmm. the right uh, artists usually for the right for for each game, and so we go through that. Uh, we'll usually get one sample from each artist um, and just see how we you know uh, and of course pay them to do that yeah. um and then uh and then we just kind of see what we feel like fits with the game um and then we'll 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 move forward with some and you know keep keep going to, yeah. to find the right one but and then the last thing i talk about before we go to the next segment on here the second part of the episode is about play test not a play test here finding your audience finding your audience so uh facebook's a great way to do it um board game geek is a great way to get some people on there going to convention tours are a good place are there any other places you can think of that will get like more of an audience to your games? Mm. Zach, where do you see your games? I usually find them at comic shops. Um, I, uh, you know, I, there are a couple just in the area that I go to, and if I see something that catches my eye or I see people playing something, I'll ask them about it. Uh, Anime Expo um, and uh, Comic Con are another place where I've found board games. Um, mostly, I find them as they are being played, and they catch my eye, and I ask about them. What do you think, bud? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, Comic Con is is pretty great. Um, you see, like, so many like every year. You see so many like new things. Um, I mean, I've found uh, games at like random shops. Like, there's a shop called Five Below, and everything's like five dollars or below. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I literally found like like I found a meme game there for five bucks, and it was awesome. It was so it was so memey. It was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, just just look, look out for them and stuff, but. Um, I think just social media and just uh, telling friends that, that tell friends and word of mouth is important. Yeah, it's proven that you will more likely see or try something if it's someone you know is doing it. A lot of my games I know from Zach, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing we're going to talk about is Kickstarter. Is it trustworthy? Uh, is it a good venue for people? Um, let's start with the trustworthy. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, the... The biggest game that was made on Kickstarter was actually Kingdom Death Monster 1.5. Uh, they got uh, $12 million on their Kickstarter, and they had uh, 19,000 backers. They beat um, the uh, Exploding Kidding. They beat it. But, again, their, their, their actual cost for unit was a lot higher, so they had less backers. Exploding Kittens had about uh, 219,000 backers, so a lot more backers for regards to that. So, I mean, there is a wide venue on Kickstarter for people that are interested in backing stuff, for, like, getting games and putting games out. Uh, for instance, uh, there have been um, about 4, 000, sorry, 41,000 um, games, games, not just board games, but video games and games, and about 37% of it is a fund rate. So if you put your game out there and you do the work that's required, you're going to get, you know, some stuff. That question is the work required, <laughs> of course. Uh, but, I mean, this is a venue. But I can see some people have issues with trust, mm -hmm. so I'll let them talk now. Uh, I'll get some out pretty quick. Um, I have had a few experiences on Kickstarter. 
Uh, most of them have been good, not all of them. And because of that, I now refuse to back anything that isn't already made. If you've got an idea, it's not enough for me. You need to already have the mechanics in order, a playable version, and you're only asking for materials and shipping cost. Then I'll back. I will even go a step further, and I will not fund anything on Kickstarter or Indiegogo because I have had already my two last experiences. Um, one of them I got two years after they said that they were supposed to be delivered. Another one, it's still two years waiting, and I got an email and they said, we can't afford to ship these to you, even though they added an additional shipping cost about a year ago. And so it was not only did they add money and I paid it, they still say they don't have enough money because of the materials they under whatever, and they still haven't sent it and I don't know when I'm getting it. So the end, I'm not funding anything on Kickstarter. Or You're just ago. done. Not, not done. Because mm -mm. it's not a guarantee that you'll get it. No, yeah, that's 100%. There's, yeah. there's not a lot of support actually from the no company No support. Itself. A lot of them are even where they manufacture well, isn't even, you know, here I in this country. I would specifically not say no support, because there has been instances in the past where Kickstarter has shut down uh, Kickstarters before they even finish with their funding, because they've noticed things were fishy. So, I mean, they've done, in some degree, they, they do exist in the process, but if it if they've done their scam-worthy duty, they've done <laughs> one step after another, they could possibly still make it through, and if they honestly are trying, but they're just horrible at it, uh, they could still basically kind of screw people over, unfortunately. Yeah, you still can't even get refunds most of the time. Yeah. You, you, they say no, if it's their money now. That, that is probably one of the worst parts about it, is that kind of aspect. It is kind of a um, wild, wild west of donating, donating and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, what's your... I know you've, you've basically yeah. been successful. You've got yeah. uh, a bunch of... Uh, what's seven, right? Seven successfully funded? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that it pains me to hear that because it is such a a, a wonderful platform for an independent creator like me. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't, I can't just put out a game um, and 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 get distributors to buy it, uh, retailers to buy it. I I can't really do it, especially when I was just starting out. There's no way I could. I couldn't have I couldn't have made these games, you know, that are so important to me without a platform like Kickstarter. And without people to take a chance on, you know, what my me and my my co-designer um, created, um, so it was. I, I mean, I love the platform so much, but I also have backed campaigns, and I haven't gotten a product myself. Um, you know, I might have spent eighty bucks, you know, and given that to someone because I believed in what they were making, and they they just didn't they they couldn't make it happen, and it, and it wasn't that they you know that they were intentionally trying to take my money. You know, it's more that they just didn't understand it's more about that business side of doing it that will allow you to go from idea to actually um, manufacturing it and shipping it out to everybody there's so much that you need to know how to do behind the scenes and learn and a lot of people are more just like ah, i have this idea you know give me money and i'll, I'll send it to you like they mean well but mm -hmm. they don't they haven't done you know what they need to do to, to make sure that they can deliver what they promise the thing that I think would kind of take it, and I'm not telling Kickstarter how to do their job. They don't. They're not funding us here. This isn't sponsored by Kickstarter. Uh, but I think that me as a backer of projects and even a creator of projects on Kickstarter in the past, I would specifically say that one of the best things they could do for the uh, consumers as well as the producers is to have somebody available for contact, like someone that just walks through, like, "What's your plan?" Because I know there's that section of like FAQ or like, "What are you going to do?" or like what's your like what's your difficulties on it? But like in all seriousness, I mean it's it's literally a, a point when someone should be all like, what's your what's your plan? Mm -hmm. Like I'm not one of your backers. I'm someone who's done this. I know this. I've I've gone through the process. I can do it. I can help you if you talk to me. What's your plan? And if they had that and it was guaranteed they had that, that would be probably uh, you know that would take it to that next level. That probably make you feel safer, right? If there was like a like a financial expert or a shipping expert that literally was all like, okay, this is your plan. Great, let's look into that. Or this is what you want to do. We're solid on that. And, and I know what you're talking about too. You're you're really talking about raising the bar of you know what you need to do to get a to be for you to be willing to back product for you. The bar is like you can't get there. You know it has to be <laughs> for him. It's a little but lower. for you. Yeah. You know you you started out here and now you've kind of moved it up here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's happening uh, because of how many games and how many campaigns are coming out there. Um, so you you really do need to. 
now creators need to get raise their campaign up to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And and I hope it keeps going higher and higher so we have less of these terrible experiences that, that backers have. I've had great experiences too, like this wallet I funded. I went to a restaurant, I was paying, they, they said, that guy who made that wallet lives two blocks from here. And there's something amazing about being able to help someone. But when the last two that I funded, same situation, I just, I, my hopes are kind of gone unless Kickstarter has a way of... Kind of rebranding it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's, it's a solid way for it. Now, there's one more thing I'm going to talk about uh, before we go, because we did spend a lot of time on trust for this, and it's a really powerful topic. It's very important, and that has to do with big companies. So one of the things about Kickstarter that is really important about it is that it's a great way for people who are independent to gain access to a media to get to people to showcase their goods. When a major company... Uh, like for instance, maybe the Steve Jackson Games or a major like board game company comes up and they're like USopoly comes and they're all like, oh yeah, here's for USopoly, the like one of the biggest companies when it comes to board games. We'd like you to back our game. How does that make you feel as people who frank with the site, who use the site, uh, or people who are just like independent game designers who have a smaller company? Do you feel like that brings people to the platform and builds it up, or do you feel it holds away? I think it's absolutely ludicrous. Do they <laughs> do they not have enough faith in their own product that they aren't willing to put their own money behind it? <laughs> like, what what is the purpose for it? I mean, I I realize, you know, it would increase the amount of games available, but I oh god, that just hurts to 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 see. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand like fan made things, like there's a lot of fan films that were started, like on on these types of sites, but like. Yeah, when you when you try to go on there and like have people fund something that's like a major company instead of independent, like it totally ruins the concept of like what Indiegogo or Kickstarter like was made for. It's made for people that can't like distribute like massively, um, at least in the beginning. And then like there's these major companies that are like, hey, give us free money. Like, no. I, not not to make you step on anyone's toes, Brian. I mean, I hear in the industry, but what is your opinion? Well. So yeah, there are there are really more and more bigger companies that are using Kickstarter, and I don't blame them at all. Um, I, there is also a limited amount of funds that can come out of Kickstarter. The more big companies that that come into it, uh, they bring their fan base. Um, so they they grow the, the the Kickstarter market, the amount of backers that are out there who are comfortable uh, going to Kickstarter, giving someone money, you know, to for a game. So I I really like that about it. Part of me does feel like, well, when if I release a game and then a bunch of these big companies with you know million dollar campaigns are kind of um, sucking all the money out of the market, it makes it feel like it's harder for me to to get people to to, to back for my game a little bit. But I mean, overall, I'm I'm happy with it. I welcome anyone who wants to use it. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I definitely see that it it's not really how. Kick why Kickstarter was made, and it's not for these these already successful companies, but I also know that making a game, if you're a small company or a big company, there is very little profit margin there. It's yeah. really hard to make money. We've been pretty successful, but I have a, I have a day job myself, and I do this as a hobby, even though, like, overall, like, it, it's, you know, we've had a pretty successful company. So there isn't, it's really hard to make it. If there's anything that will help you get the word out about your game, whether you're a small company or a big company, I welcome. Well, uh, thank you guys for watching. Before we go, I want to do a quick last minute send out. Uh, what do you guys got a shout out about? Um, well, I am the Blue Foxy on Twitch uh, until I centralize everything. But yeah. Uh, LNZ Designs on almost anything. I also Twitch and YouTube stream. So, do you got anything now? Or no. Still nothing? <laughs> Brian, shout out your stuff. Uh, sure. Overworld Games. You can go to overworldgames.com to see what we're up to. Board Game Business. So, boardgame.business. You can go there. Uh, Brian Hank or Overworld Games anywhere on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you guys so much. We'll catch you guys next week.